All right, so today we're going to do much less Rhino <laughs> and much more V-Ray. Um, as is the case that I've been doing, we do a few days in Rhino, then we come back and revisit V-Ray for a little bit, then we go back to Rhino, et cetera, back and forth. Um, so today we're going to take a much better, more in-depth look at materials and how they're made. You're actually going to somewhat create materials on your own. I will, um, in lecture today, do create a material entirely from scratch so you can see how I would go about creating a material. The reason that this is important is, yes, there's a big extensive material library that's available to you. You're more than welcome to use all of those. But every once in a while, you just want to be able to have that one specific material. And you can't find it. You can't Google search and find it. And so you're stuck saying, I want this material. How do I create it? And so I want to be able to, to kind of walk through what's happening in these materials such that you can understand uh, how they're made up and, and what makes a good material a good material. So the initially here, before we actually create anything, I want to talk through these materials and what components make up the material. Uh, and I have some examples that I'm going to be pulling up there. They happen to be in Photoshop so that I can kind of draw on top of them and, and show you. So the first one that I'm looking at here is the shingle siding. It, this is part of the material library. So I'm going to go into the material library, show you the files, and start to explain what's happening uh, as we do it. The other thing that's useful for today, uh, and you can get to it on the course website. Sorry, I've got lots of things open here. Uh, if you go to today's exercise, There is a materials test.3dm file that has uh, a, a, basically it's a cube with a sphere sitting on top that you can apply materials to and kind of see how they're working. Uh, it will look something like this. It's kind of set up in a scene. It has a light and, and whatever in it. So you can test out your materials and see what's happening and, and how they're working. So I will also be flipping back and forth and doing renderings here as we go through it. So first off, uh, as we think about the material, I'm going to pull up in my uh, browser here in V-Ray Materials. I'm going to go into Siding, and I'm going to go and open my Cedar Shingle Siding material. And so inside of the C Cedar Shingle Siding material, I have the Vizmat file. This is the file that we load into V-Ray to tell it what all the settings are. But there's also a few other things that are available here. There's something called a diff or a diffuse image. There's something called a displacement image. And there's something called a bump image. All of those three files are JPEG files, and they make up this, they're, they're components of this shingle siding. So if I open, and it's going to annoy me today that I can't open with, somehow open with is not working on this computer, so we have to do dragging here. This is the first, this is the image file that is my sh cedar shingle siding. Uh, and so this is designed as a tiling texture. So if I were to take another version of this and copy and paste it next to it, they would seam together, and it would look as if it's a continuous piece of siding. Um, so it's already been made seamless. The texture's already a seamless one. So we don't have to worry about it in this context, but we're, we're kind of analyzing what's happening here. So if I came back and I looked at this material first, the first layer of this material sorry, it's this one, is that image file. So that's part one here. That is the image file. It usually has some kind of like an underscore and then diff after it. This is awful handwriting, but there you go. Sorry, I'm stuck. Usually I can use my iPad, but that's on my computer, not the school computer, so I can't. So this first one is the diffuse, and it's just the image file. That's all you get out of it. The next piece that makes up this material, number two here, is something called the bump map. And if you look at this carefully, you see that it doesn't do too much other than give us the wood grain texture. And so the file that is doing that work is this one right here. It's essentially a high contrast black and white image. You know, there it is. High contrast black and white image of the shingles. So there's a lot of difference between white and black, and it adds texture in that white and black. Um, so it's pretty easy to create, actually. Uh, and that gives us this wood grain texture, part number two. Part number three here is called the displacement map. So we have the diffuse map, we have the bump map, and then we have the displacement map. And this is the one where it really matters. This is where I'm able to give myself 
the actual tapers to the shingles. And that's made up, and it looks like this one. And so what it is is it's a gradient from black to white. And if we imagine, and this one might be backwards. I can never remember which one's in front and which one's in back, but there's a checkbox for invert. So if you did it backwards, you can, you can fix it later. <laughs> the idea here is that the difference between 0 or white and black is a specific value. And we can specify what that is. It's 1 inch. It's 4 inches. Uh, and so the gradient is going to change from 1 inch to 4 inch. So when we combine them all together, we get this third image down here that has the wood texture on it, but it also has all the shingles sloping back, which is the point. So we've taken the image, we've added texture, we've added displacement, or in this case, the tapers of the shingles, and we get the final output, which is number four right here. So it takes all of those to make up our example. So let me switch over to my materials test, and let's look at these as I actually re uh, render. Uh, first thing I'm going to do is load my V-Ray toolbars, because they didn't load. And I have them stored on my flash drive in my resources folder, so they're nice and easy to load. And there we are. Uh, then I'm going to open my material library. And I'm going to see if my cedar shingles loaded correctly. Yes, they did not. Let me go ahead and load those. Um, get into my resources, V-Ray, V-Ray materials, siding, wood. And now I see it. OK, so let me go ahead and turn a few things off before we do any renders. So bear with me for a second. And so here's my first render. In the material, and we're doing this backwards. We're going to end up creating the materials, but I want to point out where all this stuff is. We've already kind of done this a little bit where we've adjusted the color before next to it. We have uh, the ability to insert a map. Uh, and this M button, the lowercase m or the capital M, is representative of what's called a map. And so in this case, it's a diffuse map. If I click on that M, it's going to go find that file on my flash drive that is the image file of my shingles. There it is. So it's telling it, use that image file as part of the rendering. And now, if I were to apply it to this shape, let me take these shapes here. and render it. I'm actually going to zoom in so we can see the differences here. And I were to render it, it would look like cedar shingles, because it's an image file of cedar shingles. But if we look at the edge here, it's perfectly flat, and there's no actual texture on them, other than what the photograph looks like. So the next piece of this rendering is the, sorry, is the bump map. And so that's available. We just did diffuse. If you scroll down under maps, the first option here is called bump. And so we'll turn that bump on. And in this case, it was already on in the material. I turned it off for this demonstration. We'll turn the bump on. And I have it set at 0.5. This is an arbitrary value. You have to put a number in and see what happens. Usually, you start at 1, see if you like the texture. If you need less, you go less. If you need more, you go up. Um, the map, once again, I'll click on the M. It's going to be the shingles bump, and it's the high contrast black and white version of my uh, shingles siding. So there it is. I have my value set at 0.5. That's the value that seemed to get the right results for me. And now I can go ahead and do a render, and we'll see the difference. So already when the render starts, you can tell that it's a little bit different. All right, and now that I'm looking at the, the shingles, you can tell that they have a little bit of wood grain to them. I know the projector's not that good, but when you guys try to do this uh, on your computer, you'll see this happen. Uh, I can see there's now some wood grain on the texture. It's starting to feel a little bit more realistic. The next piece, but if I look at the edge here, it's still perfectly flat. The next piece would be to have the, the actual profile of the, the cedar shingles. So I'll go into my V-Ray <laughs> materials. And once again, I'll come all the way down to the maps one. There it is. The next one is displacement. And so this is where units matter. 
I've asked you in this class to always work in inches as your default unit. That's important because this value here is in inches. So right now, the difference between black and white on my displacement map is going to be a half an inch. So at level 0, it would be, sometimes it's easier to draw this, right? I have a level 0, and I have a level, uh, you know, in this case, it would be 0.5. And so the black areas on my shingle, right? So this would be a gradient if I was looking at it. This would be black, and it would get lighter going back to white. Hopefully that kind of makes sense. This would stick up by 0.5. Next shingle, this point here would stick up by 0.5. If I change that value to be 1, 2, 3, this would get taller. So I could have a shingle that was like this if I wanted to. If this value was 4, for example, that would be 4 inches. So you can see if my units were off, and I had units that were in feet instead of in inches, and I did 0.5 feet here, if this stayed at 0.5, I used the shingle siding, it would be sticking out 6 inches, which obviously is not right. So I'm going to set that one. Once again, if I click on the M for displacement map, um, the displacement map is already loaded. It's this gradient example. Oh, looks like I was backwards. It's, it's white to black. Uh, if you happen to be backwards, there's a convenient little invert button right there. Invert, check it, um, so you can go backwards. So it's white to black, the opposite of what I just drew on the board. I'll go ahead and say OK. And now that that's been loaded, when I go ahead and do this render, you'll notice that the speed will slow down significantly. Uh, and that's because V-Ray is taking that flat surface, what used to be a flat surface, and saying it's no longer flat. On a certain pattern, it's going to stick up. And it's going to be particularly noticeable along this edge. So where this edge used to be a flat line, we can now see that it sticks up at each of the levels of the shingles. And so using those three files, I can create this look. Yeah? It also shows up really, like, really well on the curve of the wall. Right, right. So if I were to zoom out, uh, you can see the, the, the shingles stacking on the curve of the ball. So the point is that that displacement map is a very, very valuable tool <laughs> in V-Ray and or in Rhino to be able to create a, a strong texture. So something like shingles, it really matters. Could you go in and model every individual shingle? Sure. But would that take a lot of work? Absolutely. Yeah. So modeling a flat plane and applying this as a texture can make a big, big difference. So let's go through and, and look at a few other examples. And then we'll talk about actually creating it. So here's an example with steel siding. And I'm not going to go in and show you all the, the various components. I just wanted to show you this. So this is like a corrugated piece of steel. And so in this case, we have the image file of the corrugated piece of steel. Uh, so that's number one. The second one right, is the bump. And it's basically smooth steel. So there's not a whole lot of texture to it. Could we put a little bit of texture on it? Sure. But would you ever really see it? No, because it's smooth steel. So you want to be aware. The wood, we'd see the grain on the shingles. Brick, we'd see the little pit marks in the brick. Something like this steel, it's pretty smooth. Not too much we can do. However, the big one here is the displacement. This one, this is where we get the wave texture. And that wave texture is made up. Let me go in and, and show you that one in a second. There's our corrugated steel. The wave texture comes from an image file that looks like this. Remember, it's the gradient from white to black. So we're at a high point, we go down into the trough, we come back up to the high point, we go down into the trough and back up, etc. So we take that to create that wave pattern. There's the wave pattern. And finally, in number four, we assemble the whole thing together. So if I were to load that into my example file here, go into my materials, let me load in that. And this, uh, this corrugated steel, by the way, is one that I made uh, from scratch. 
Now that that's there, we could go ahead and render it. Now there's going to be some challenges with this because we're either going to see the wave on one edge or the other because it's complicated. And I don't know off the top of my head which one it is. Well, you can certainly see it on the ball clean there. So I'm going to let this keep going. But we may also need to adjust the scale, because we might need to adjust what that displacement value is so that we can control what the wave pattern uh, looks like. Anyway, you guys get the idea here. So we've stuck with those two examples with bump map, displace, uh, diffuse map, the first one, bump map, which is the second one. In this case, it's kind of non-existent. Third one is displacement map. And finally, we get the last one, which is assembled altogether. Now we can do another example here where we have different pieces. So in this example, we have the first one, which is kind of the metal texture itself. The second one is called a transparency map. And that controls what's hollow, or what's, what's solid, and what's not. And then finally, we get the, the assembly of those pieces. So let's take a look at an example like that. I'll go into my materials. And I'm going to load up one of those mesh examples. Uh, metal screens. There we go. I'm going to apply this material to the selection. Now before we actually do the rendering, I'm going to take a look here. So right here under Diffuse, we had a uh, color, which was assigned. It's kind of this grayish color. Um, I don't have an image file because I didn't need one for this particular case. Um, I can mimic what the metal looks like without an actual image file. In the transparency, however, unlike with the cedar shingle siding, which doesn't have transparency, this one does. So we see that the M for map, the transparency map, is, is capital. So that means there's a map assigned. Let me click on that M. And we can see right here, there's a transparency. And once again, we're going to use that black and white value to show what is transparent and what is not. So there's my file, the white being transparent, the black being solid. And that's going to then tell Rhino where, or tell V-Ray what's hollow or what's see-through and what's solid. And so we've applied that uh, in this case. I'll go ahead and say OK. Now, if we come down to the bottom here under maps, we don't have bump map or displacement map checked because there really isn't anything to that. <laughs> we maybe could have a little bit of bump depending on the texture, but there's, there's not a lot there. So we're putting our, our effort into the transparency map. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. Uh, let me do the first option here. Let me turn the transparency map off, and then I'll come back and turn it back on. And so this render, this is <clears throat> the first example. The transparency map is not on. I'm seeing the metal, and I'm seeing black where it should be transparent, because that's what the original uh, image was set up for. Now, if I went in and I turned that transparency map back on, there it is. <laughs> And I have to invert it, sorry. And I were to render it. This is, again, going to take a lot longer to do the render, because now we're going to be able to see through the holes. And so you can already kind of, well, you guys can't see it on the projector. Let's see if it finishes and you can see it. Yeah? So I assume if you then invert it, then instead of you like looking like it has a bunch of holes, it just looks like a bunch of spots. A bunch of spots floating, exactly. So you can see this, this slows down quite a bit once you put that transparency on, because it's got to calculate as if this were see-through what's behind it. 
So I'm not going to let that finish because I don't want you guys to watch it. However, I would like to point out that when you do that and you render, it, the little holes apply toward the shadow. And you might not be able to see them. You can kind of see the faint little specks there. So it's not just the material itself. It's all the shadows and the light that it's, that's, that's passing through it. So this was one example. I have another example here. Uh, this is the yellow mesh, where I have the photograph of yellow mesh. Then I have a, uh, a bump map of the yellow map mesh or a displacement map, depending on if you wanted a little bit more control. Then I had the transparency map that controls what goes through it. And finally, I get the combination of all of them. OK, so same strategy being applied here. OK, so now for creating your own materials today. Uh, this was just kind of explaining what's happening in the materials. Now let's talk about creating the materials from scratch. If you have not taken 135, <laughs> you're going to do part 2A only and not attempt part 2B unless you want to. Uh, part 2B, for those of you that have taken 135, sorry, you had me once. I know you can do it. Okay, uh, Will be to create one entirely from scratch. And I'll walk you through that process just so you can see me do it. I'm only asking for one entirely from scratch, okay? So you don't have to do more than that. But I want you guys to really think through this because it is a valuable skill to be able to say, oh, I need this, this particular type of texture. Let me just go ahead and make it. Uh, and a lot of the textures that are in the material library were ones that I just made because I needed them for something. Um, so we'll start with the uh, non-135 graduates. Um, what I'm going to suggest that you do is go to a, uh, a website that has V-Ray materials, but they're not V-Ray materials for Rhino. They're V-Ray materials for, say, 3D Studio. And so you won't be able to just load the VizMap file, but you can get the diffuse map, the displacement map, the bump map, and you can kind of build it from there. So oops. So don't worry about it. Just leave it. We'll get it later. Um, so uh, the one that I found that's pretty good is V-Ray materials.co.uk. If I typed it right. Got to love it when people's websites don't work, right? I did check this. All right, so here comes Google search for V-Ray materials, right? Oh, wait, here we go. It's, it's got some issues, but it's starting to load. OK, so they have a bunch of materials, some of which um, have files associated with them. Some of them don't. Um, so let's go into, let's try cloth and see. Um, and I like the free ones. The free ones are always good. So this purple is, is awful. But let's take a look at it. Let's download it. Um, download now. Make sure you don't click on the Add. It's that button there. And it's downloading. All right, there it is. It came as a zip file. So I'm going to right click and extract all so I can see what's inside it. We'll extract it right here. There it is. So what does it have? It has a diffuse file. It has a bump file. So that's for the texture on it. It doesn't have a displacement. It also has a reflection file. So if the fabric has some reflection or some shine to it. I guess the original one had some shine to it. I'll show you how to load it with the, with the shine if you want it. OK, so now I need to come out, somehow create this material from scratch. So they're calling this modern wallpaper. I might call it purple swirl cloth. Um, I'm going to go back into my material test page there and close that for right now. I'll go into my V-Ray materials. And actually, let me. my list here is getting a little long. I'm going to purge the unused materials so that I can get down to creating a new one. So let me right click on Create Material. I'm going to create a new standard material. There it is. I'll double click it, and I'm going to call this uh, cloth purple swirl. There we go. And I'll say OK. 
There's my cloth purple sorrel. So the first thing I need to do is I need to load in that diffuse image that represents the cloth. So I'll go first to my diffuse drawer, click on the M for the diffuse map. There's currently no map assigned. I need to assign one. I'm going to pick from this drop down list here text bitmap, which basically just means image file. Then I'm going to go to my downloads folder, which is where this was, and I'm going to pick the diffuse map right there. I'll say open, and it will load. The rest of these settings are all fine. We'll go ahead and say OK. And if I were looking at this uh, particular material, it would now have the swirls assigned to it. That's good. It doesn't have the texture to it just yet. That's the next piece. That's going to be done in the bump map. So I'm going to scroll down here under maps. I'm going to turn on the bump map. And then I'm going to click on the M, the lowercase m here, to assign a text bitmap. And in this case, it's the bump map. It's this one. And I'll go ahead and say open. And I'll go ahead and say OK. Now I have to guess at what the value, what the appropriate value would be for this. Like I said, starting at 1 is usually a pretty good place to start. So I'll leave it there. I'm going to assign the purple swirl to this object. So apply material to selection. I'm going to zoom in a bit so I can try to see this a little bit better. And then we'll do a render. So if we look carefully at the edges of the swirls, we can see that I'm getting a little bit of a shadow. I'm getting a little bit of it standing out, depending on the angle. So that's about right. If I wanted less, I'd come in here under the bump map, and I'd change that value down, so maybe 0.25. And then I'd re-render and see what it looks like. On the opposite hand, if I change this to be 10, for example, it might be too much. It might stand out too much. Uh, and we could do a rendering, and we could test that out. Remember, it's not the displacement map, so it's never going to be huge. It's just small increments. Uh, and so in that case, yeah, this is sticking out a little bit more. And eh, I don't like it so much. So I'm going to go back and change it to the first option, which was just one right there. That seems about right. So then it also included a reflection map. And so why cloth would need to have a reflection map on it, I'm not quite sure. but. They included it, so I'm going to show you how you would add it. You don't have to add it. Um, so in this case, I need a reflection layer. Currently, it's not reflective. So I would need to right click on my purple swirl, say Create Layer Reflection. <laughs> and remember that initial reflection, as soon as I put it on, is going to be really strong, as if it were like purple glass or something. It's going to be real shiny. So I'm going to have to turn that down a little bit. Let's open that reflection drawer. There it is. First thing, the map, the reflection map. We go ahead and go find the bitmap. There it is. So OK. And once I've loaded that, let's take a look and see if it toned down the shine. OK, now it's super, super shiny, which is probably too much. So then it would be a matter of turning this down. So maybe I would do this at uh, 0.1. So we have a little, still awful lot of shine to it. Again, I didn't create this material, uh, so I'm struggling to see why uh, the cloth has to be shiny. But you guys get the idea of where that's going into place. Um, we might go back. The other option would be to turn this back to the Fresno route there and to assign it under the highlight glossiness and see if it likes it better there. I don't, like I said, I don't know. I didn't create this material, so I'm not sure how they're using the reflection. Uh, but sometimes this can be a good strategy. Yeah, that one looks a little bit better. So we've got a little bit. Let's turn this back up. Yeah, still too high. <coughs> so you'd have to judge for yourself what feels right uh, as this. So we'll try that one. All right. And then you could always do a render and see how that looks. And again, I tend to do the close-up render so that I can see, uh, is it working? Does the texture look the way I want it to? And that sort of thing. 
Um, like I said, under part 2A, I'd like you to do this for at least four materials. So you're finding four examples and you're trying to reassemble the material uh, for, for V-Ray for Rhino. When you're done with a material, switch yourself under set view, go to the render material test view, which gives you the whole uh, shape. And from here, go ahead and do a test rendering of your material. So I'd go and just go ahead and do that rendering. I'd get the whole object. This object already has the texture mapping applied to it, so you guys don't have to worry about texture mapping or anything. You could adjust it if you felt like you didn't like it or you wanted to, to tweak it a little bit. OK, so that's been applied. I'm going to save this image. So let me go onto my flash drive into today's exercise. And let me just create a folder for uh, cloth purple swirl. And this was the cloth, not a squirrel, first swirl example. And I'll save. That gives me the rendered example. Now, I currently have a material that's referencing two different, three different things. The diffuse file, the bump file, and the, displace, or and the uh, reflection file. I want to collect all of those into one place. I'll do that by packing the material. So I'm going to right click on purple swirl, and I'm going to say pack material. That's going to go gather all the pieces, all the linked reference files. And I'll put that in today's folder as well. So I'm going to go here to my demonstrations. And I'll put it inside here. There's the cloth purple swirl. And that's then going to pack all the, the necessary materials together. I could then unzip it and put it into my material library if I wanted to have it in my material library for future use. Um, but you will be posting the rendered file as your, um, uh, as your, as your preview, or your, your um, oh, sometimes your brain just goes dead, right? So it happens to me too. Um, <laughs> as your featured image, thank you. It was there. It just wasn't coming out. Uh, as your featured image, you'll put, put the, the rendered file as your featured image, and then you'll upload a link to the zip file. Um, so that somebody else could download it and use it. There is also the ability to tag the material when you go to upload it. If I was creating a new post here, to help other people find it. On the right side here, we have V-Ray material. Right there. And you can, you can help people find it later on. These, by the way, are all available. If you go into resources and you go to the V-Ray materials library, you can do the V-Ray materials index, but you can also get into any of these individual categories, a lot of which people have contributed to over time. Um, when you're looking at things, so here's an example of somebody did a brick in here. These are all ones that students have done. If it has the digital tools logo on it, that's one that I did. So you know that I've like vetted it and it works. Okay, um, it doesn't mean that some of these other ones aren't really good. The tiled carpet is a good one. Um, there's a fur texture one. This one's kind of fun. That Ryan spent some time creating, so you can have like a furry object of some kind. So the point is, there are other really good ones that are in there, and you're more than welcome to borrow any one of those, um, you know, for use later on. So just be aware that they're there. Uh, and if you tag them, yours will go into that, that same little uh, library of materials. So I want you to do that for at least four materials. And you can, if, if you're a 135 graduate and you make your own materials, you can you know, skip one or two of those materials because this is more work to create your own material. Uh, so the next part, I, am, I told you I was going to walk through. This is creating a material entirely from scratch. And so sometimes. You just need a material, and it doesn't exist. So for example, I really want to put a solar panel on a roof. I don't have a solar panel material. There isn't one in the material library. So well, I better make a solar panel material. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to go find 
a solar panel. And so I did a Google search for solar panels. Uh, I ended up doing solar panel texture because I thought that would be a better strategy for finding one. You have to kind of look around. Stay away from the ones that have the um, watermarks on them because you don't want watermarks in your final rendering. It won't look good. Um, and you want to spend some time. I, I made sure that I chose in my Google search tools to choose a file larger than 2 megapixel right there. And so as I'm looking through, I'm trying to find one that's larger than 2 megapixel. There are images that don't work. Like this one here doesn't work. It's warped. It's kind of blurry. Don't pick that one. Some are better than others. So you have to, yeah. Oh, do I have solar panels? No. So much for that example. I'm still going to do solar panels for you. <laughs> Probably means that I did it at some point. Uh, OK, so when it comes to downloading a solar panel texture, right? I picked this one. Um, this one is already a tiling image, so it, it's really easy because it will tile itself together. Um, if it doesn't tile together, I should pick one that doesn't tile together to do it. OK, so since I already have that, fine. I'll do something else. Let me do a wire mesh. How about that? <coughs> I had a wire mesh up here. thought I did. Well, I did already download some on the, the website. So one of which, one of the ones that I was going to do was a roof. Um, there are some roofs already on there. Uh, and I'll, I'll do that one for you, but it takes a lot of effort to get it right. Uh, here's a wire mesh example. And let me go ahead and open that one in Photoshop. Or not. Boy, I'm going downhill. Couldn't talk anymore either. OK, so here's a wire mesh example. I got this from a product store. They were selling this wire mesh. That's where I found the original image. Uh, so first off, as I look at this image, there are some issues with it. If I were to think about this uh, tiling itself together, um, see how it, the, the lines of the wire mesh kind of bend? Well, that by itself is a problem, because it's always going to look like it's bent. So I have to correct the image first off. Uh, and so I'll do that by turning on my rulers. I'm going to go to View and then Rulers, so I can see my rulers. And that's going to allow me to drop some guides in. So I can click and hold on the ruler and drag a guide over to see how crooked these lines really are. So the vertical ones aren't the worst in the world, but the horizontal ones are pretty bad. So like that one's pretty far off. This one, eh, it's, it's reasonable. So what I need to do is I need to figure out how to straighten these out. So I'll start down here. With this image, it's currently a background image, which means it's locked in Photoshop. I'm going to right click on it and say layer from background. And I'll go ahead and say, OK. That gives me an editable layer. And so remember, I'm, I'm talking to all of you that have taken 135. If you didn't take 135 and you don't know Photoshop, this isn't a class about Photoshop. So you don't have to learn it right now. You can just create your, your materials uh, otherwise. However, for those of you that I did have in 135, this is important to, to get this process down. So I'm going to go up to the Edit menu. And I'm going to go into Transform. And I'm going to choose Skew. And I like skew over warp because we're just controlling the four corners. It makes it a little bit easier to start. So I'm going to pull this down to start to straighten out that lower line. It's still not straight at the top, so I need to pull this one up to start to straighten that line. I may need to drop another guide down to help myself. So I'll pull that one up just a little bit like that. I also need to adjust the verticals. So like this line here needs to be adjusted. So that's going to pull out a little bit. And that's going to pull out a little bit. It may take a little bit more. I may have to move my objects just a little bit. OK, that's working. Let me pull this one over a little bit more. Pull that one over a little bit more. And so you can see I'm working through this. Like I said, 
you may need multiple guides. We may need to look there. Oh, that one's still not far enough over. That needs to go over further. This one needs to go over a little bit further. And that's what those vertical lines can really help with. You can try to get those uh, aligned correctly. So now that I've worked on it a, a bit and worked with that skew, I'm going to commit to it. And now that I've committed to it, it's time to start looking at this from a how am I going to tile it together such that it repeats nicely. So first thing that I need to do is I need to kind of identify where are the patterns in here. So obviously we have these, these squares that are repetitions. Uh, so if, let me turn off my uh, guides for a second so they're not clouding us out. Uh, view, let me clear those guides. So if I looked at this corner here, over to that corner, and down to maybe that corner, and back over to that corner, OK, that's a reasonable segment. I'd be able to repeat that over and over again, and it would look decent. I'll go into my crop tools, and I'm going to crop out parts of the image that don't matter. I could do a little bit more. I could include that part of the image, but it's still a little crooked. I'm going to stick with right here, right about there, and I'll pull this one to right about there. <laughs> right like that. And I'll commit to it. There it is. So I have just this little bit of my, of my mesh at this point. I'm going to press Control-0 so we can see it. There it is. What is this thing? No, close. Go away. OK, so now I have this little bit of my wire mesh. I'd like to be able to repeat this <laughs> over and over again such that they would be perfectly seamless. And I'm going to do that by using the filter, other, and then offset. And what this does is it slices up my image. It divides it into four and reassembles the pieces such that the outer edges will always match up. Let me put this at 0 and 0. Sometimes it's helpful to see this. Let me cancel it for just a second. If I had another example here, if I have one. <coughs> Hold on a second. I'm just picking a, a, piece, a piece of roof texture here just so you can see how this, how this works. So when I go into Filter, Other, and then Offset, it's essentially, let me go to 0 and 0. There's my original image. As I start to move this line over, it's going to cut the, the image and then reassemble the two pieces. So it cut the image right in the center, and it put this, this edge here, which perfectly matches that edge on the outsides, and it put this seam right there, you can see the vertical line, in between the two. So th as long as that seam goes away, this edge will always match up perfectly to that edge. If I do the vertical at the same time, I have to solve this horizontal line that doesn't match up and this vertical line that doesn't match up. That's part of creating the tiling texture. Uh, and so I just wanted to point it out in a kind of a graphic example so you can see the lines. So you guys can't see that nearly as well as I can. Apologize for that. Anyway, let me go back to my. Um, Mesh, there it is. So I'm going to go into my uh, filter, other, and then offset. There is, by the way, by the way, a complete tutorial on how to do this. Um, let me start at zero zero, and then as I move this over, it's going to reassemble the pieces. About right. We'll move this one over too. Maybe a little bit less. And because I was careful about where I did the crop, it makes it a lot easier to seam these together. So if I were to zoom in here, the seam is right there, for example. So if I wanted that seam to go away, in this case, I might not even need to do it. I could use a clone stamp tool. Let me make the brush a little bit smaller. And I could copy from, a little bit smaller still. I could copy from this side, and I could just kind of run, oops. It's hard because it's a mesh. It's so small. I could run my way along here and make that seam go away. <laughs> a 
again, clone stamp works by holding down the Alt key, copy from here over there. That's too much there, etc. So I'll do another example where it takes a little bit more um, work. In this case, it's pretty good by itself, so I'm not going to overly worry about it. So this first example here is my image file that's going to represent the image of the mesh. So I'll go to File, and then Save As. And I want this to be a JPEG file. There it is. And for lack of a better place, I'll put it on the desktop. I'm going to call this uh, Mesh dash diffuse because it's the color color file I'll click Save best quality there it is so the next thing that I needed was I needed a bump map which was a high contrast black and white uh, image I can do that by one converting to black and white I'll go to layer new adjustment layer channel mixer and I'll say okay I'll turn this to monochrome not that it made that much of a difference in this particular image, but you might have one that does, so I'm showing you how to do it. Uh, I'll do it in monochrome. Uh, then I'll also go into layer, new adjustment layer, and I'll do levels. It's just to make sure I have a high contrast black and white. I have my histogram shows true black and true white already, so I'm good. So I have those two pieces. Now it's time to save the bump map. I'll go to file, save as. And sorry, this should be a JPEG. And this was our mesh bump. <coughs> and I might choose not to use the bump at all, but I'll make it anyway. Now the next piece was that transparency map. And this one's going to be pretty easy to do. Uh, let me create a brand new layer. And I need to paint on here in black and white what I want to be transparent and, and what I want to be solid. So I'll use the uh, selection tool, I'll use the magic wand, and I'll select the white regions, which again makes my life pretty easy. I'll hold down shift and select all the white regions. There it is. And I need to paint all of those on a new layer in white. So we'll go ahead and paint. I'll use the paintbrush tool. Let me make my brush a little bit bigger here turn everything off so we can see what I'm painting and there we go that's painted in now I'm gonna invert my selection so I'll go to select and then inverse and this time I will paint in black there's black and I'll paint in between here in black so this black and white version is now what's going to be used as my transparency map to control what's see being seen and what's not being seen. So I'll go to File and then Save As. And once again, this will be a JPEG. And this is transparency. And I'll go ahead and save. I'm not going to worry about a diffuse map or a displacement map because there's not much to it. Let me go back into Rhino. I'll go into my materials. This one that I'm going to create, I'm going to create new standard. And this is a mesh square. Uh, it happens to be a 2 by 2, so I'll put that in too. <laughs> All right, so first thing I need to do to create this material is open the diffuse drawer and load my diffuse map. So I'll click on the M next to color and go into my bitmap and this was on my desktop there is my diffuse right there I'll go ahead and say open I'll say okay if I hit the little preview we'll see that yep I've got it but it's still solid so the next thing would be under transparency I'm gonna add a transparency map so I'll click the lowercase m here it's going to be a text bitmap, and I'm going to load up transparency. And like I said, this is the one that I always get confused about whether which way it is. So I'll say OK, and then I'll preview it and make sure it went away the correct direction, which it did. If I was backwards, it 
it would be like Jason suggested where I'd have floating little squares and transparent in there. So I don't want it to be that way. Sorry, wrong one. So I'll go back to, sorry, not having an invert. It looks the way I want it to. That's great. I need to apply it to my object. I'll right click, say apply material to selection. And then I can go ahead and render this one. So I made a mistake because my object is intersecting with the inter infinite plane, which is why I get that collision happening. So I really need to move that up ever so slightly. Bear with me for a second to move this. Uh, it doesn't take much. I just moved it up an eighth of an inch. And that collision will go away. That was my mistake in the sample file. I should have done that uh, ahead of time. So there's my wire mesh example. So I was able to create that from scratch because I wanted that wire mesh, for example. And so this is something that's important to remember is you can always create a material if it doesn't exist. Some materials take a lot more work. If you do brick or, or you do something that's not as easy to select the materials to create the transparency, it can be a little bit more work to create it. Um, in, the, in one of the other examples that I was starting to work on, let's see if I can find it here. I wanted to work on a roof. Yeah, it's right here. And so I already did the tiling texture on this roof. Uh, I should open the original so you can see this. Hold on a second. It was, it was this one. There was the original uh, roof image. And the reason I didn't do this one live is this kind of a texture takes a long time to, to make the seams go away. It, it takes a little bit more practice. So in this case, um, before I, I started doing the tiling texture, I looked for similar shapes. So like this piece here is the same as this piece here. See the pattern? Likewise, if I look down here, this little shape matches this little shape. The colors are different. This little shape here matches that one that's extending down. Uh, this one, let's see. Yeah, I have to try to remember here. Uh, this one with that edge matches up to this one with that edge. So before I even do the tiling texture, I'll crop this down so that certain pieces match up with other pieces. Um, so let me see here. This one, we'll pull this one over. So I'm thinking about this adding on to over there. That feels about right. I want to make sure that this matches up there. Sounds pretty good. I'll go ahead and commit to it. Then when I go in to do the tiling, so I'd go into my filter, other, and then offset. I'll start at 0 and 0. As I move this horizontal line over, there's the horizontal line. It's almost invisible because I thought a lot about where I'm going to cut it to begin with versus the other example where I showed you and it was an obvious line. So the more you spend time in that, the easier the heel is going to be to, to correct it. The vertical here, uh, I don't think I did quite as good of a job with it. Yeah, it's going right across there. So it would take a little bit, but for the most part, it matches up pretty well. So I went ahead and I had already started working on this one. Right there, there was my example where I already started working on it. This one already tiles, and it's seamed so that you don't see any of those lines, so I could start using this. The next piece of this, though, was to create that bump texture. And in this case, I wanted a slope. Because this is a roof, it's going to be sloping back. So I needed to figure out where the front edges were and the back edges were of each of these tiles and make each one slope backwards. And so to do that, I selected these regions like that and then I painted them with a gradient. So there's a couple that have already been created. 
I'll do one more in front of you. So I'd go, okay, this piece here comes down, and I'm using a polygonal lasso. It'll be close enough for what I'm trying to create. <coughs> to right there. And this comes back up. Can you see why I didn't want to do this in front of you guys <laughs> for the whole thing? Uh, so now that I have that region, I'm going to come over to my uh, gradient fill from black to white. And I'll fill from one side to the other side of this particular shape. So now that's sloping from black to white. And I think I'm doing this backwards, but I'll use the invert to fix that. Uh, and so I'd go through, and on each of these little shapes, I'd have to do the same black to white conversion. When the shape ends up at the top, so this shape starts at gray and goes to white because this black shape up here matches up with the black down here. So I have to go black up there as if it were continuous. So I could do the same thing on this piece right here, for example. This shingle goes off the bottom. So when I did my gradient, I would start deliberately a little bit low, the distance here to here. So we'll go to right about there. And I draw the gradient. So it's gray versus black. Then I'd come up to the top, and I'd draw in this piece. Like that. And I'd paint with the gradient, and I'd start black here and make it about the same distance as the shingle, so it's about like that, so that the black starts there and would <laughs> attach in. So it takes a little bit of work to do that over the, over the seams, but you get the idea about how I would create the depth and the, the stagger of this particular tile. I would also need the high contrast black and white version of this. So once again, that was in uh, layer, new adjustment layer. First one was channel mixer to convert it to black and white. I'll check the box for monochrome. Now it's in black and white. Uh, then the next thing, I would go into my uh, layer, new adjustment layer, and it would be levels. And I just want to make sure that I have it punchy enough such that I'd have some real white dots and some real black dots. Just like that, right? There we go. So I have some real punchy black and white dots. That's going to give me a nice texture on it. Um, and that would then be my um, bump map. So I can create these entirely from scratch, but obviously it takes a little bit more work to create them. So I wanted to walk you through that. Um, so at the end, I'm looking for uh, four or five textures, the bulk of which are coming from ones that you find online. If you want to try to tackle the Photoshop one, or if you did take 135 with me, I expect you to tackle one of the Photoshop ones. Um, take your time on it. I would rather have you create a beautiful, great texture and fewer of them than a lot of textures that are poorly done. Does that make sense? If you're going to use them, make them good, because then you'll be able to use them, and they'll be really good. Okay. Um, so we already did that. I'm just checking through. Yep, sounds good. Perfect. So I know it's long, but take your time, because the end result is something that other people will benefit from, including yourself. Try, when you're coming up with your material, to think about a material that you might want to use. If there's a material that you really like, uh, for example, I, I really wanted to be able to use a copper that was kind of an oxidized copper that had that green tint to it. So I had to go figure out how to make that copper, because I wanted that patina. So that was, a, that was one that I thought, oh, you know, that I'd really like to use that. I also love Corten steel, that rusted steel. So I went and found Corten steel and tried to make a, a material out of that. So think about something that might be interesting to you and try to create that material uh, versus one that isn't as interesting to you. Okay? All right. 